All right. Well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, shall I say. My name is Jamal Lewis. I'm the Pilot Program Manager for the Partnership for Inclusive Innovation, and welcome to today's Smarter Together webinar. Uh, this webinar series touches upon how multidisciplinary applied research and technology development can be used to make a community impact and improve the human condition. Um, I'm very excited to introduce this week's webinar, uh, which features the partnership's latest pilot program uh, grant recipient, Georgia Working Farms Fund, and a panel of local farmers and partners to discuss the plight of the Georgia farm and propose solutions for a healthier, more equitable, and resilient food system. I have the great pleasure of introducing you, our moderator for today's panel, Stacy Funderburg, uh, the Working Farms Fund Program Lead and Regional Council. After Stacy's introduction, he will introduce and bring in our other panelists to add to the discussion, followed by a Q&A session with any remaining time. Please remember, we welcome your questions in the corresponding chat area throughout the presentation. Stacy, you can begin whenever you're ready. Thanks, Jamal. Welcome, everyone. Um, as Jamal said, I'm, I'm Stacy Funderburk, and I lead the Working Farms Fund initiative at the Conservation Fund. I'm so excited you can join us today uh, for this discussion of one of our newest programs, which is being launched right here in Georgia. Um, this um, is a, we appreciate all of you taking the time to listen in because this, this is a topic that really impacts all of us. And I also want to thank the Partnership for Inclusive Innovation for this opportunity and for the recent award, which is going to propel this program forward over the next couple of years. The best innovations arise from the most difficult challenges and our food system is in major trouble. The average age of the farmer in the US is 58 years old and climbing. We're losing farmland at a rate of 175 acres every hour. That's 175 acres while we're on this call today. And it's largely due to sprawl in larger metro areas like Atlanta, but also uh, mid-sized cities like Columbus, Macon, Augusta, Savannah. And something very important is being lost. And it's not just farms and a knowledge of farming. We're also losing a connection to land and a connection to where our food comes from. At the same time that this is happening, consumer-driven demand for more local and more sustainable, sustainably produced food is soaring. And un unlike many agricultural production areas around the country, Georgia is unmatched in the diversity and the number of next generation farmers who are looking to transform our local food system. Land access and access to capital are the most significant barriers to innovation and profitability for this entrepreneurial group of farmers. The Working Farms Fund stands at the intersection of these challenges and opportunities for our local food system. And with the Working Farms Fund, we're building a first of its kind program that will one, purchase small to mid-sized farms that are at risk of getting lost to development, two, match next generation farmers through a lease to own program, three, secure public conservation easement funding to permanently protect the farm and to lower the future purchase price of, of the farm for the farmer, and four, sell the farm to the farmer at an affordable value, revolving those funds into the next purchase. And by scaling and replicating this approach, we can ensure that Georgia's future includes a network of innovative entrepreneurial farms selling to local rural communities and to larger markets to meet consumers' demand, growing demand for more local and more sustainable food. We can also build a model for the rest of the country to follow. And this isn't a problem that can be solved overnight, and it can't be solved by one person or one organization, which is why we brought together an incredible group of panelists today to highlight how we're already working together to rethink the future of our local food system. This afternoon, you're going to hear from a very successful farmer who chose to reinvest directly in his community in a food hub that supports many local growers across Georgia you're going to hear about revolutionary leadership by an institution that is committed to local and sustainable sourcing for its students, for its employees, and for its hospital patients. And you're also going to hear from two of our first Working Farm Fund teams who truly represent the future of our local food system. We're working hand in hand with these partners and others like them to build a healthier, more innovative, more resilient, and a more equitable local food system, and we're just getting started. 
So I'd now like to turn it to our panel and I'm going to introduce each of them very briefly to give a quick background before we move into the discussion today. And a quick reminder, if you have questions along the way, please post them in the chat. We'll have about 15 minutes for Q&A at the end of our panel discussion, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can in that time. So post questions as, as you have them, uh, and we're looking forward to the discussion. Um, I, I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Demetrius uh, Milling for a quick uh, intro. Thank you, Stacy, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm Demetrius Milling, a worker owner at Love is Love Cooperative Farm here in Atlanta, Georgia. We've been working with the Conservation Fund and we've been paired with a land match out in Newton County and Mansfield, Georgia. Thanks. Uh, Kianet Howitt. Hi, my name is Kianet Howitt. I'm Associate Vice President of Resilience, Sustainability and Economic Inclusion for Emory and Emory Healthcare. And our role in the Working Farms Fund is as a large institutional purchaser. We've partnered with the Conservation Fund to craft food purchase agreements so that we are saying to farmers in advance, we will buy your food, which provides them a level of security so that they can pursue uh, financing from banks and can know that they have someone who is an interested buyer. Thanks. Uh, Keith? Yeah, I'm Keith Kelly, uh, president of Kelly Products, and uh, we, we are a kind of a multi-tiered agricultural concern. So from farming to uh, all the way to retail and uh, even the regulatory compliance portion of it as part of what we're doing here and uh, excited to be a part of this. Thanks, Keith. Robin? Hey, uh, my name is Robin Shannon. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Global Growers Network. Uh, we partnered with the Working Farms Fund uh, to get matched with a 23-acre property just outside Atlanta in Rockdale County. Thanks, everyone. Um, well, I'm going to get things started um, with a question for Keith. I mean, as I, as I was given the intro, I think a lot of the challenge here, of course, is a loss of farmland. I grew up in uh, in small town, the middle Georgia, Milledgeville, Georgia. So I'm also familiar with um, what we've seen in, in the transition and loss of farms over time. Keith, I, I'm wondering um, if you could just give us a background of what you've personally seen happen with local farms um, and local food in Georgia since you started farming. Um, and then I'm hoping you could follow up with that with a little bit about what you've done personally to try to change that trajectory um, in your geography. Sure. So in a, you know, a very short period of time, I'm going to say 55 years, 60 years, I'm a little older than that, but around that time frame, when I was a kid, there were lots of small family farms all over the U.S., but in particular in Georgia. In the county I live in, in Morgan, there were over 150 uh, independently owned family dairies. Uh, today, there are seven, and there will be fewer than that probably by the end of the year. Uh, and this has happened all over Georgia, so you can take any kind of farm you want to from you know, row crops, vegetables, hogs, which almost don't even exist in the state today, poultry that has gone, you know, uh, industrial today. But all those things uh, 50 years ago were all family farms. Our food systems were very spread out, very safe um, from a, you know, from a perspective of having any kind of uh, disruption like we just had this last year with the pandemic. Um, and from the various reasons, economies of scale, competition, all kinds of things, farming in that 50 year period has consolidated. I'll just take the beef industry. There's about five main packers in the US that control the entire market. Uh, there is some legislation in place today to try to start, restart some of that today to put in abattoirs, if you will, uh, around the country to spread out that, uh, that risk. But what we're doing, um, as an example, in the last five or six years, uh, we built a retail concern in Madison, Georgia, that is kind of a hybrid. So it's built, it has retail, of course, you can walk in and purchase uh, foods, but it also has wholesale and online. And today we have 300 plus local vendors that uh, sell us everything from meat products to 
jams, jellies, all type of other products, breads, you know, anything that has to do with grocery or food. We have over 300 mom and pop, if you will, or local vendors that are selling us product. And over the last five years, we're, we've helped them market their products, try to get into some bigger locations to make it more sustainable for them. Uh, we put their products online and, uh, and we're continuing that work even today. Uh, we've got, you know, professional training that we're offering to some of them and some of them are taking advantage of, you know, setting their company up on a stronger basis financially and, and looking how, you know, looking at ways to grow um, their business to a sustainable level uh, and what that means to get into places like Emory and other places like that. And as you and I've discussed in the past, you know, there are, there's a big need for infrastructure to allow these people to further process their products. I was visiting with a, a young farmer uh, in uh, Moultrie the other day that's taken over her father's farm. They grow sweet corn, they grow peanuts and things of that nature. And, and she's come to the conclusion, you know, I've either got to further process the products uh, or get bigger. And, you know, and I've done a lot of research over the last few years on agriculture because it's a passion of mine and in particular restoring our local communities in rural areas is a big passion of mine. And today's opportunities are get really, really big so that you can farm in the industrial space, uh, get vertically integrated, uh, a bigger part of the supply chain. And that can mean value adding. So taking peanuts and making peanut brittle, I'm just making that example, but, but those are the things or, or become a hobby farmer. I mean, you know, it's uh, or get out. I guess those are kind of the options. But the family farm is really struggling, and I admire you guys for you know really taking on that that role of ch trying to champion that back into existence. And I and I really believe it can. I mean, I, we're we're betting the house on it, so to speak. You know, and doing everything we can to help these uh, beginning farmers, young farmers, um, from marketing support to retail support to you know any any number of things, packaging. Uh, any number of ways like that to help them get their product to the market. Uh, and if it means education, whatever it means, uh, we're, we're in this with you guys to try to help this come about. And it more because it's a passion of mine, uh, you know, to help support our retail business, but to help support farms and that way of life uh, and food security, which I think is a huge issue today that America faces. And, I think until we do get it uh, somewhat spread out and find a way to do that economically and profitably, we're going to struggle. Uh, but I think all those things are possible. I think it can be done economically and I think it can be done profitably for the farmer. Uh, but it's going to take a different uh, approach. It's going to take some vertical integration on the farmer's part. We call it D to C, direct to consumer. One of the things I was talking to this young lady about the other day was taking corn when it's ready and actually bringing it to Atlanta uh, in truckload quantities or whatever quantities, and then having it pre-sold digitally where people can come in at a certain time and pick it up. Um, you know, there are canneries still in South Georgia, a lot of them still down there that where you can actually take corn to them, have it processed, have it bagged and, and direct to the consumer that way. So I think there's some things like that that we just got to, take a hard look at it, what makes sense from a infrastructure perspective to take things like Demetrius is growing and others are growing. How do we process that so that Emory can take it? You know, a lot of cases, places like Emory aren't capable of taking raw vegetables and, and then preparing them into a finished product. They need it in a more finished format. So we're going to need some freezing, you know, facilities and things of that nature where we can take even secondary crop that won't make it on the retail shelf, but could be converted into a, a great product for cooking or whatever, squash and things of that nature that 30, 40% of the crop gets thrown away. And in most cases, when you're talking anything from blueberries to squash to whatever, uh, cucumbers, 30, 40% of it every year is wasted because it's not number one quality for a grocery store shelf but yet it would make perfect product for, you know, a finished good that would go into a soup or a pickles or whatever you want to do with them. So there's a lot of things like that we just need to approach. And I, and I think it's going to help those farmers that we're trying to set up 
to preserve this land to have some of that infrastructure so they can then sell it to Emory and places of that nature through a distributor network. So anyway, I, I know I'll rattle on, but. Uh, All right, that's perfect, Keith. And I, I mean, I think you're right. We're going to get into that a little more too, talking about the innovations of the marketplace that might change um, changes going forward for some of our aspiring farmers. But I, I really just am inspired by the uh, investment you've made in your local community and standing up farm view as an example. So, um, well, I want to, Demetrius, let, let's swap over to the, to um, this uh, next generation of farmer, you know, that, that you represent. And I, I think it'd be helpful just to know, like, what inspired you to start farming? I mean, I think a lot of what we're going to see with the Working Farms uh, Fund program is, Sometimes we'll be helping a, a six or seven generation farmer expand or um, their farm, but other times there'll be people who are newer to farming who need this bridge to land access and capital. So can you talk about what it is, you know, that inspired you to, to start farming, why you do it, and then a little bit about your connection with the Working Farms Fund and where you see, see things going next? Yeah, so um, again, I'm Demetrius Milling. Um, from Atlanta, my family's been in Atlanta for about five generations. So anybody who hangs around Atlanta knows that's rare and rare every single year. So um, just, and being from Atlanta, my family never had a farm. We were more so working in factories or different mills, car repair, different things like that. And so as growing up, we had a garden in the backyard and that was pretty interesting. But ultimately when it was time to pick a career, getting out of high school, I, I was thinking about what I wanted to do, and I, I ended up going to Georgia State, still unsure what I wanted to do. And once I got to Georgia State, I was like, I really am not enjoying sitting in the classroom all day. Also, no one told me that college is just like 70% homework. So I was like, whoa, and, you know, coming from a family that didn't go to college, you know, my parents didn't say, by the way, you're going to do a lot of homework, uh, or you're going to be working and figuring these things out. So I was like, okay, that's not really what I want to do. So I, I started volunteering, doing different things. And I volunteered on a farm here in Atlanta, Brightside Farm. And then after working there for a week, I was like, this is really interesting. And I also asked a bunch of people, you know, because I was unsure of what I wanted to do, uh, what they liked about their career or what they didn't like. And a lot of people told me a lot of things they didn't like. And really what it came down to is they didn't feel they were challenged. They didn't think they were having new things every single day. And they really didn't think they were learning. And they thought that was really key for them. And so I was like, you know, I want to get a career where I'm learning, I'm challenged, and it just feels new all the time. So being outside, the weather's new, the seasons are different, and farming is just constantly a challenge, no matter what. Everything you think is going to happen right, there's it's just going to be some variation of that. It doesn't have to be bad, but it's going to be a variation. So it was pretty interesting being out there at Brightside Farm with Erin Siscuti. And, you know, I talked to her about how I wanted to pursue this as a career. And then she, you know, suggested I go get some education. And so did my mom. I have to make my mom happy. You know, you don't want to disappoint your mom. So uh, I went to Gwinnett Technical College, got an associate's degree in horticulture. And then I started working at Love is Love Farm. And from there, I worked up my way also over at Gwinnett Technical College. I worked on their student run farm, great program. Uh, I also managed their farm for a year too. Um, started working at Love is Love, worked my way up. And now uh, we've entered a partnership uh, with a couple other farmers and we're starting to work our own cooperative, Love is Love Cooperative Farm. And I really do think that uh, me coming up after Keith, not only the next, next generation of farmers, but it's pretty unique because the way that I enter farming is just completely different from Keith who grew up in a rural setting and saw farms and saw what they were and now you know frankly the decline of small family farming in America versus when I stepped on the scene in Atlanta and in urban settings there's this farm revival people are interested there's a lot of energy around that and curiosity about what it could be so really my journey starts off in a way where it's super interesting there's this problem with our food system where people just aren't connected with food when they live in an urban space and more and more people are moving to cities or your family is like mine where it's just always lived in cities for a very long time so it's just all this excitement around local food so when i jump in uh there's the issues of like how do we teach people where their food comes from how do we connect with customers more how do we all farms say that is land, earth, and our food system, also the farm themselves. And so there's all these problems to figure out and solve 
and to do them in community. So it's really interesting uh, where I jumped in. And I think that that's allowed farms such as Love is Love and the group over at Global Growers to really uh, be in a position to connect with people. Uh, kind of like Keith said, he's like sell things online, sell things face to face, um, just have this real connection instead of having another brand be the ambassador for your product uh, is real different. And so kind of along the way, being along pioneers in this sphere and learning from them, uh, it's been really awesome and exciting. Um, and one reason we decided to make a worker owned cooperative is because of this potential partnership uh, that came to be with the Working Farms Fund. So the Working Farms Fund heard about the idea and heard about the work that we were doing to get this local food into the hands of people in our community. Um, we also at Love is Love Farm sell produce, uh, seasonally all the way from April into December. And we also sell transplants uh, for starters, for home gardeners. So that's in the spring and the fall. So we have multiple ways that we're interacting with our customers. And after we started talking to the conservation fund and we just, especially out around the time of the pandemic, just saw this huge demand that was already there just grow even more. You know, we have a CSA and our CSA has about 200 families that we serve. After the pandemic and people seeing the importance of local food, our wait list, we couldn't take any more people. We got 150 families waiting to get onto our wait list. So the demand is there for local food and the demand is there for people to interact with this community and they, they desire it. So, you know, just explaining that to the Working Farms Fund and also just a desire to not make the food inaccessible to people. Put food, our food that we think is high quality, just like the everywhere else you find, and putting in places like Emory and convenient places. And that's the next step of this evolution of how do you enter, how does a family farm or a small farm enter the sphere with Emory on the wholesale component in a sustainable way and not being blind saying, we're just gonna take over all of Emory's supply chain, but how do we fit into this uh, realm where we can just plug into what's already being prepared? Like he's saying, like what infrastructure do we need to be able to reach these markets on a local system? and you know, the most important thing is matching farmers to land. And that's where the Working Farms Fund really came through for our group. So we have a group of five farmers that have come together from all different walks of life, multi-generational, mostly ethnic. Um, and so we came together and we presented this idea to the Working Farms Fund and they were already getting it off the ground. So we came together in partnership and they secured the land over in Mansfield, Georgia for us, around 70 acres. Um, and we're hoping to expand our vegetable production to about 20 acres and doing some more stuff on the transplants. And, you know, this wouldn't be possible without the Working Farms Fund because the opportunity to grow the business and have the connection with institutions like Emory to back up the growth um, is really important. It gives a little bit of security when you go out there and you're growing your markets. Um, and also the opportunity to own land. That's a big disconnect between, you know, the areas that Keith grew up, you know, people own the land and the markets were shifting and changing and they weren't able to, for many reasons, reach those markets, but they own the land and they had something to lend against and be dynamic a little bit in some cases, not always. Uh, but on this smaller scale in this family farm in an urban setting, you know, the land is usually leased. There's no certainty there. And so the Working Farms Fund does give a farming group, whether it's a family or a group, some certainty when purchasing this land beyond the markets, uh, but the certainty that you're gonna put work in here and it's going to be yours. Yeah, thanks Demetrius. Yeah, and it's exciting. I, I mean, this group, I can't wait to see what they do on, um, on their expanded uh, farm now. Um, was just out uh, watching one of the farmers, Monica, take a first spin on the tractor a couple of weeks ago. and. Um, I can't wait to, to watch that farm transform. And it has also been really great to see, um, thanks to the partnership with Emory, that this farm team is now getting ready to grow in the fields there at that new farm in Mansfield um, so that they can begin selling to Emory in the fall. So it's a great part of the story. It's absolutely essential to have this kind of support for the farmers that come into the program. Um, we could go around and protect a lot of farms and end up with failed farmer failed farm operations there. But our goal is to actually create this new network of small to mid-sized farms that are successful and selling into institutions and others in the city. So Kenneth, I, I, I think it'd be great if you could talk a little bit about why Emory is committed to local and sustainable sourcing and then 
um, maybe a little bit about how our partnership works and, and how you see the Working Farms Fund align with uh, the goals of Emory. Sure. So those of you who aren't familiar with Emory, um, we have a university and a healthcare system and we're the largest employer in Atlanta and we're the largest healthcare system in Georgia. So that alone gives us a real responsibility and in my opinion, a moral obligation to watch out for all Georgians and to really think about how we can help um, further sustainability and equity in our state and in our metro area. So that big picture is how it aligns with our mission for positive transformation in the world. And more specifically, we have very aggressive greenhouse gas reduction goals, net zero by 2050 for our enterprise. And one piece of that is reducing the distance that our food travels. So for the past 15 years, we've had a 75% local or sustainable procurement goal for our food. And after 15 years, we realized we were at about 40%, which actually was pretty good considering where we started. But we want to get to that 75%. And to do that, we knew we had to help grow the base of local farmers who were especially those who were producing sustainably. Um, and so we, I have known Stacy for a long time, and we heard about the Working Farms Fund and the fact that they were providing land access to farmers and thought that this could really fit in nicely with our goals. As Keith mentioned, with COVID and with the reality of climate change impacts already disrupting our supply chain, we had to think about how we could support a more resilient local food supply because we have patients and we have students who we have to feed. And you know, looking at what food is available, you realize very quickly that it is not just the right thing to do, it's the smart and responsible thing to do to grow our local food supply. So we um, started talking about the role Emory might play as a purchaser. And as Stacy pointed out, you know, they were really focused on the land access, but we thought if we could just say, listen, we'll buy your food, um, that that might be really helpful to recruiting farmers to join Working Farms Fund. And then once recruited to enabling them to go to the bank and Stacy and I've actually met with bankers to get advice about this. And they said, yeah, you know, if we have a contract, that contract could be collateral for tra traditional financing, which the farmers will need to buy, you know, a greenhouse or a hoop house or, you know, all the things that are necessary to get your farm up and running. So we feel really honored to be able to play that role. And then we also have very strong equity um, requirements around procurement. And we thought this could also really help further our equitable procurement and economic inclusion initiatives by targeting historically disadvantaged groups. So female farmers, Native Americans, African Americans, those who have historically been denied land access to really say we're particularly interested in helping support those farmers gain access to markets and to land. Um, so then I would just say, finally, so it supports our equity goals, it supports our greenhouse gas reduction goals. Um, it also supports our interest in Georgia's rural economy and the prosperity of all Georgia families. And then we also have asked that if farmers are willing, our, some of our faculty would like to use those farms for research on the potential for carbon sequestration in agricultural lands. And many of you know that this is a very hot topic right now, but several of our scientists are worried that the policy is getting ahead of the science because there's still a lot of unanswered questions about proper farming practices that will lead to permanence in terms of greenhouse gas sequestration. So what's going to be wonderful is to the extent the farmers are willing to be able to have farmers that say, hey, we'll do white clover ground cover, we'll do red clover, you know, and try all these different methods to see if we can figure out a way to um, responsibly sequester those greenhouse gases because then 
farmers really have something they can monetize. Then big institutional partners like Emory, but also many, many corporations are eager to be able to offset um, their greenhouse gas emissions through something like an agricultural-based carbon offset. So I hope I didn't talk too long, but that's um, where Emory is benefiting and so happy to be partnering on this. Thanks, Gannett. No, it's it's tremendous the leadership Emory has shown. and. My hope is that uh, many other institutions will follow. One of the unique things about Atlanta is we are anchored with large institutions, universities, hospitals, um, and a lot of Fortune 500 companies um, here. And so seeing that commitment grow over time in the same way Emory has made this commitment, those are the types of things that really can begin to transform our local food system um, and in a way that benefits local farmers as well. So it's, it's really exciting. And um, Kianet touched on, uh, you know, part of our commitment in the program too is ensuring that at least 20% of the farmers in our program are um, are historically disadvantaged farmers. And so we we have a, a long-term commitment to that. Um, I am especially excited um, to talk about Global Growers Network, which is an organization I've known for a long time. Um, and I've seen the incredible work they have done um, to help a group of farmers get access to land and um, access to markets in a very meaningful way, but not own the land that they produced on. And so, Robin, could you talk a little bit about the farmers that, that you work with, a little bit about Global Growers Mission, and then how you see the Working Farms Fund opportunity um, help to expand the impact of Global Growers over time? Yeah, thanks, Stacey. Um, so Global Growers Network exists because uh, a little over 10 years ago, we recognized the unacceptable reality that talented international farmers who had arrived in Atlanta as resettled refugees were ending up food insecure and also oftentimes with diet related illnesses. So despite being experienced food producers, um, through this disconnection from their land, they were ending up in, in jobs that weren't using those talents and offering poverty level wages. And they were having a lot of difficulty in finding affordable and culturally familiar foods to maintain those traditional diets uh, that, that keep them healthier. And so since 2010, Global Growers Network has uh, worked to partner with people from diverse cultures to grow fresh food for their families and for local marketplaces. Um, so we focus uh, on creating land access uh, for talented food producers who face current and historical barriers to land and to capital, accessing capital. Um, and we do believe very strongly, like those on the call today of ECHO, that smallholder farmers will play a leading role in improving outcomes related to food security, uh, community vitality, and also biodiversity. Um, so it was about five years ago, um, you know, we started out all working on leased land. And about five years ago, we recognized that land ownership was really critical to making our model work. Um, and so our partnership with the Working Farms Fund is really bringing that, that dream to life. Um, but as others have said on this call, you know, our work's also made possible by investments in local uh, food hubs like Keith is doing and shifts in procurement uh, like, like Emery's and this rising demand that Demetrius spoke to um, as well. So, we are um, really poised now through this partnership to deepen our impact significantly. Um, what the way that Global Growers will operate this new farm is um, as a co-farming space. And you can imagine a co-farm as an analog to a co-working space uh, that hosts startup businesses. So we will be creating the physical infrastructure that small farmers will need to thrive. Um, in our case, that includes high quality land, um, uh, high quality organic soils, agricultural equipment and distribution infrastructure to support market access. Um, and like a co-working space, you know, we also work to build communities that can support one another um, and access a network of resources that, that we can um, help to, to coordinate. And, and so our project is really working to center the um, aspirations of, of skilled growers who we've partnered with, um, who are motivated to increase food access in their communities. And that is especially by um, producing culturally familiar staples that are, are in high demand 
um, and are, are, are more closely tied to positive health outcomes um, as, as well. Um, and so we're looking to increase the economic stability and equitable access for growers uh, experiencing bar barriers to securing land, uh, startup capital, and distribution channels. Um, we are also looking to increase the availability of fresh culturally familiar foods. And um, we would like to, through building community, really also improve social cohesion across our networks through opportunities to connect to the land and pres preserve and share important food traditions. Um, so we are starting out by being able to facilitate land access to farmers by um, continuing to lease out that land. Over time, you know, the dream would be that the Working Farms Fund can also support those farmers who are interested in pursuing land ownership on their own. Um, when we started doing this work a decade ago, we really didn't know if that was ever going to be possible. And we recognized that without a partner who was focused on protecting farmland in a, at, a, at that systems level, that 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 vision may not be a reality. And so, I mean, I, I, you know, I can't say enough about, you know, the power and what that can do to help drive the work that we're doing by having uh, this pathway to land ownership that, that will make it possible um, for, for farmers to, to do this. And, you know, Keith spoke to this uh, uh, earlier, but, and, and sa same with Demetrius, you know, traditionally, um, farm businesses have um, got, gotten their start by inheriting land and inheriting equipment and infrastructure and oftentimes relationships too. Um, that has broken down and, and, and we've got to in the kind of a similar way that, you know, we've, we now are talking about regenerative agriculture instead of just sustainable or organic. You know, this is a, an opportunity where we need to regenerate some of those social community uh, connections um, as well. We've, we've gotten a little bit behind and it's now kind of time to, to make up for that lost time and, and get back on track. Uh, so, you know, I'm thrilled to, for Global Growers to, to play a small role um, in, in that and really uh, excited to see where, how this comes together. Uh, I'll also say, you know, it was right as I was graduating from Emory University that they made that announcement of the 75% commitment to local food. Uh, I would have never imagined that I'd be in a position to really contribute to that target. So um, it's a very gratifying thing for me to um, be able to have that also open this door and that opportunity to having such a strong procurement um, partner. Uh, it does make this type of investment, which is still risky and a little scary to, to move forward with, it makes it feel more, more secure, uh, more attainable. So thank you all for that. Yeah, thanks, Robin. Um, and I think that it is an important thing. I mean, thinking about the long-term investments in a farm space, um, the fact that global growers now will own that space going forward and they're on the patient pathway to mm -hmm. land ownership just opens up new levels of possibility in making those investments that benefit their um, their program and their farmers. So really excited to, to see what happens with that farm too. Um, I, we don't have too much time for more of our, before we open to Q&A, but I do, um, I mean, one thing I wanted to throw out um, is we've, we've seen this, we've talked a lot about these challenges that the food system has faced over the last year, but um, I, I would like to ask to the group, you know, what gives you hope and where you see innovation opportunities for the local food system moving forward? I think Keith began to touch on this um, in the infrastructure investments and the marketing opportunities, but I do think as we start to build out this network, there is some, there is a lot of power in branding this and marketing it in a way that people understand, because the reason consumer demand is growing so fast is people, it, it is, they want to know who grew their food and where it was grown. And that is not going to change. I think that is only increasing going forward. So how do we make sure that we build on that with what we're all doing together? So I'm curious, anyone have thoughts about that or where they see um, and the pandemic, as, as has been noted, may have accelerated that, but where, where do folks see um, that headed from here? Where are the best opportunities to innovate? Uh, 
Well, I'm happy to jump in. And it's really something that I think Keith touched on, which is thinking about um, some sort of processing of the foods from the farm. And, you know, I'd love to know what Demetrius and Robin think about this, but I know that when we look at how we're doing on our 75% food goal, and as I said, we're around 40% right now, one of the toughest areas for us is processed foods. And, you know, we're trying to make it sustainable. Um, so, you know, we're buying Newman's Own or whatever, you know, something from California. And, um, but that's really just because we, we need to have more options for processed food locally. So one thing too that is really wonderful about Working Farms Fund is that we're in communication with the farmers. So we can say we need a bunch of kimchi or we need a bunch of whatever it is we need. And they can, to the extent it works for them, um, sort of grow to that need, which is really wonderful because that is better for them. And we also have a big ugly food program. So we take food that isn't retail pretty um, because we're going to turn it into tomato sauce or whatever else. Um, so I just, that's one thought, but I'd love to know Demetrius and Robin's thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, what about um, Demetrius, maybe you could touch on this um, and Robin could too. Anything, what do you see as possibilities in innovating? One of our goals is to make sure that not only that we help um, grow this, this type of local farm around uh, metro Atlanta and beyond, but we make sure that there are more sustainable farming practices on site and how we can think about how to access um, existing federal or state programs to accelerate that. Sometimes we might be able to get philanthropic dollars to help accelerate that. What are your thoughts on that and, and where you think um, that could head? And, and again, gets back to markets too, um, especially if that comes with a premium, um, that could be uh, all the incentive you need. Yeah, I think that there that's definitely a great point. Um, I think that first off, I think every farmer really does want to see their land be successful for the long run, you know, long term success, and they want to be doing the right thing. But you also have to balance what's best to keep the farm going. And I think that's maybe where some of these issues arise, you know, that we've faced. And I think that having the branding that we've all talked about in the marketing, so that people do know you and your practices is going to be really beneficial. And like, you know, the partnership with Emory and the other partnerships that we're talking about being created through this community and the farmer doesn't necessarily have to be everything. You know, we're talking about infrastructure. There's great people out there that, you know, Keith knows, other people know who are trying to make great products that are really tasty. And we will love to put our food in there. I don't want to create a tasty product that's not coming out of the field, you know, so with jams, jellies, all these things, you know, leave that to someone else who has a passion for that and connecting these people together and they can serve Emory so they can reach their goal and know that that product is made with sustainable products also. So all the way through the system, I think that, you know, as we build this infrastructure and more importantly, the community connections, these things will really be great for the long run um, and spur other business economic growth in the Metro Atlanta area and any other Metro area that this program expands to, you know, creating a, an economy that is vertically integrated and really transparent, uh, but also resilient because of this partnerships. Yeah, that's great. And I have to bring Keith back in around that point. I mean, it's interesting, and we've talked about this. I mean, a lot of this is about transparency, right? Like understand, I mean, the, the willingness of Emory to say, this is these are our needs, right? And to allow farmers to actually see that and understand it. But there's also a transparency all the way to consumers. Um, and so I don't want to get too deep in the weeds of blockchain, and there are lots of other complicating factors, but it's interesting. You go to Europe, and you go to buy your steak on the shelf and you can scan it and it will tell you the farm that it was grown on, the types of sustainable, sustainable practices. So technology is really accelerating this ability to be more transparent about where our food comes from and how it's grown. And it really does tie into that marketability. I mean, Keith, I know you've been giving a lot of thought to this marketing side of things. What, what do you think about that? Where do you think we're headed um, if we can increase, or you know, how we can increase that transparency going forward? You're on, you're on mute, Keith. Yep. Oh, that, excuse me. Um, I'll back up one step. So the, the one thing that uh, that's really, really exciting to me is there is tremendous demand. If you have demand, you can do a lot of things. If you're trying to create demand, it's, it's a hard push. 
there is lots of demand out there for locally grown products. Consumers do want to know where their products are coming from increasingly. It's not everyone, but increasingly that is becoming a big issue. Two years ago, we, cre we created, because I have a software concern, we created a blockchain for cattle. Uh, we, we haven't shelved it, but we're not doing as much with it at this moment other than our own cattle because the USDA backed away from source of origin legislation that was gonna make it you know, a, a, a mandate that you had to provide that. So we kind of, we just quit the marketing side of that component. But, but I'll say this, you know, one thing that I'm excited about right now, so we have a dairy ourselves, a small dairy in Morgan County. Uh, we've just made a big expansion uh, on our creamery. Uh, so we've added goat cheeses to it. We can't buy enough goat cheeses at this moment. So if anybody on this call has an interest in being in the goat dairy business, we can use it. We're, we're only getting about 500 gallons a week right now. And that's all we can find at this moment. So, but we are making cheeses. We're making our own ice cream. We're bottling milk and our sales are pretty much maxed out with what production we have today. And we will soon, as we get the, the final touches made on this uh, ex expansion, be looking for other dairies to start bringing in. Our goal is to build even a bigger creamery, uh, probably at Farmview, not in the same facility, but at that, on that property uh, for expansion to add more local farmers into that. Because there's still a few small farmers that are hanging on. If they could get a decent price for their milk, which we can do that by going direct on this whole process, um, then we could expand. And, and we've seen a, a big demand for our artisan crafted cheeses, uh, our goat cheese. Like I said, we're selling all the goat cheese we can make and have a, a backlog of people that would like to buy it. Uh, the ice cream we're making, we're selling like crazy right now. There's a big demand for a really high uh, butterfat, like we're making uh, ice cream. So it's really high quality ice cream. They love our non-homogenized, you know, cream line milk. So that, you, I see the success of that and it gives me encouragement that other commodities, other products like gardens and like uh, vegetables that Demetrius Simmer are growing can be further processed and put into the marketplace and there's gonna be a huge demand for it. Um, whether that's tomato sauce or that's uh, cream corn or that's tomatoes or that's fresh stuff, whatever, there is going to be a growing demand. There's gonna be a growing outlet through some uh, electronic mean. I'm not sure how that's going to be yet. We're working on all kinds of different ways with some of the counties in Atlanta to uh, find a way to get directly to through them to the public where they could have areas they could pick up fresh vegetables or processed vegetables or processed meat, you know, like hamburger and things of that nature that we also grow and process ourselves. Um, and so there's going to be those ways that are going to be created that allow for that, what we call D2C, direct to consumer from Demetrius and other people that are like, that are doing farms like you're, you're, you know, y'all are promoting right now. And, and I think it'll be there in a year or less. Uh, yeah. Some of the, some, at least some of the trial work will be in place for that to start happening. Yeah, that's exciting. Uh, but, but you know, the main thing is demand. I and mean, there is, yeah. we're not having to create or make demand. The demand's yeah. there. It really is just trying to figure out how, what does the supply chain look like? How do we get some further processing built into it? And then how do we get that to the consumer? And there's a lot of, you know, we're using grabber. We've got our own trucks. We're doing all kinds of ways to get it to the consumer today, but there's going to be a lot of that kind of thing taking place. Yeah, that's great. Year. That's exciting. Um, Robin, anything to add on that? I mean, I know you've, uh, it's been interesting. I love some of the stories. Uh, I think about the Burmese eggplant story uh, early on, but you know, this uh, specialization, you have a CSA that for your growers too. Um, what do you see as the opportunities, especially as global growers expands um, your footprint? Sure. One of the things we've learned through through our network, and I was talking about this earlier, is there's a lot of demand for very specific types of vegetables. So, you know, we grow, um, I think that, you know, 75% of the world relies on about 12 crops for majority of their diet. But at Global Growers, we have a crop list of about 65 different varieties. Um, and so I think 
really seeing that diversity and bringing that back and recognizing that, you know, biodiversity as being a key to a resilient food system, but also understanding how cultural diversity adds to the vibrancy of their communities and the connection between those things is we're also trying to tap into um, that additional demand. And that's a market that, you know, we've seen all these uh, and it's wonderful to see all these CSA programs start and local farmers markets, and that is really responding to um, to the demand that you know Keith Keith is talking about. But I really see there's an underserved market out there that is accustomed to and seeing and used to having homegrown, very fresh produce. And with that fresh produce, you know, we also know that fresh food is more nutritious food. You know, the longer something once you harvest a plant the nutrient value starts to go down. And with that, you lose flavor. Nutrition is flavor. And I would like to see, you know, more, um, and I think the demand is there, but seeing our supply chains that really value nutritional quality, not just the caloric value of a product. So, you know, Demetrius was talking about this, you know, of, um, of you know, farmers want to do the right thing. You know, they want to make, they, farmers probably care about the environment more than, you know, non-farmers, honestly. I mean, that's a, a value that I think folks with a deep connection to the land hold dear. But when they're responding to a demand that is measuring their success by how many bushels of a product they can crank out and not measuring that success by the value of it and the nutritional value, you know, we've gotten very good in glo on a global scale through the green revolution of producing calories through monoculture cropping systems. And, you know, I don't, I, I think there's now more demand for nutrition, for flavor, for quality, and that calls for an investment in soils. And so I would really like drawing those connections and finding ways and partners who can, you know, help to sell that value uh, to me is really critical, as is critical to really make sure that we are investing in a diversity of crops and, and productions because, you know, that, that's also about uh, the resiliency of, of, our, of our ecosystems and our, uh, you know, as I see it, our, our social systems as well. Yeah, that's great. And I agree. I mean, I think a lot of this is also about lowering some of the barriers or the hurdles, right, to getting more sustainable practices on site. One of the things I'm excited about for the Farms Fund is at least creating a more patient pathway to the land ownership and helping to bridge that farm purchase on the front end and also ultimately make it more affordable can open up opportunities. Again, we need to I mean, just like Kiana mentioned, like we need to go to banks and local financing, figure out what the financing options are through existing USDA programs. But I think there are ways that we can help catalyze that upfront investment in the equipment and infrastructure that's needed uh, for farmers to produce more sustainably. And then you connect them to these marketing opportunities to make sure that they actually get more bang for their buck when they're selling those as they should, right? Because you're producing more nutritious and, and healthier food. Um, I think uh, another thing um, Demetrius touched on early on, the education opportunities. When I think about the future in a network of farms um, within a couple hour drive of Atlanta that are doing this type of production, there's a chance to also get kids and people back out on site. It's not easy to go. I'm from, you know, small town, middle Georgia. It's not easy to go down to South Georgia and see a farm. But if there are these farms in closer proximity, um, and Keith had a great story. I think we did the, when um, we were talking um, a few months ago about kids coming out and like learning what certain veg the vegetables they, they actually grew in the ground, you know, things just surprise. And we got to get back to that. And it's not that hard, especially when it's in close proximity. I mean, kids should be out on field trips. Um, I think uh, the Love is Love Farm is also going to be adjacent to one of the new path trails um, that connects Mansfield to Conyers. Um, so I'm seeing people uh, in the future are going to be biking to a little farm market there. So I'm really excited about those connections going forward. I think that there's a huge opportunity um, on the education side and growing out this, um, this network. I think I see in the chat, we already have a goat farmer stepping up to the plate. Um, I'm thinking about all the connections that happen on these calls. I heard Keith say he makes ice cream. I heard the Emory students like ice cream. Well, I'm, I'm just guessing all college students like ice cream. So 
um, you know, I, um, I I really think it's exciting to think about um, about that going forward. Uh, I, we only have a few more minutes. Any last thoughts or questions, just things that people um, didn't get a chance to say that they want to offer up before, um, before we wind things up? I'll invite everybody to an event. We have July the 24th, so Farm Bureau is coming out. They do a children's book every year. And this year, um, some of their uh, art came from inspiration at our dairy. They came shot pictures and they, they painted it. And there's going to be a reading of that book at there for kids and stuff. And so uh, it's open to anybody who would like to come that day. And there'll be tours of our organic garden. We have about an eight acre organic garden there that we grow food for our employees, about a hundred thousand pounds of produce a year that we grow for our employees on that. And um, so we tour that and the dairy and the creamery and that kind of thing. So anybody would like to come, we'd love to have you. That's Thanks, Keith. Kiana, I see there is a quick question for you. If you, I know we don't have long. Um, the question was, is Emory or a partner leveraging a database to marry supply and demand needs for sellers and buyers, along with tracking the traceability of nutritional caloric um, intake of the foods? Yeah, so um, it's not any very, um, it's, we don't have a big public database like you may be talking about, but what we do have are um, relationships between our chefs and our farmers where we do menus and we identify the foods we need. And this is in advance so that farmers can grow to what we are going to be, you know, cooking and serving to our students and to our patients. So it works that way where we have lists and we'll say to global growers, we really need bunch of sweet potatoes or you know whatever it is um, so that way they can plan around it in terms of nutrition you know um, we don't have anything where we map that particular piece of food but we do have information for our um, consumers at the point of consumption about where it's grown and you know if it's organic or if it's um, got a different kind of label like fair trade or you know so we do try to do a good bit of education at that point of consumption as well but we have not done uh, you know a robust public database just haven't spent our resources that way but it's a nice idea Casey thanks and I just also wanted to say for Ted the goat farmer anybody else who has a lead on someone. Um, I have people reach out all the time and then I direct them to Stacy and then Stacy goes and visits the farm and then we see if that works for Working Farms Fund. So, you know, please follow up with us. Um, yeah. Thank you have our contact information. Yeah, and, and I should, thanks, Ken. I should have, uh, at the beginning, Christian Barsa is also on this call. He's our working, he's our Working Farms Fund associate and he's done an incredible job. I mean, if you ask any of these farmers, he's the reason that, that they've been matched to those farms and um, that every that all this work is underway. So um, reach out to me or Christian and um, just you know, want to say thanks to everybody. Again, I, I'll, I'll turn it back to Jamal, but I just say like, this would not be possible without the support of the Partnership for Inclusive Innovation and them seeing this as a real innovation for our local food system. So we're so grateful. I'm so excited about all the partners we have at the table, and uh, we're going to have some some pretty exciting things to report on our next uh, panel. So, Jamal, I'll turn it uh, over to you. Thanks, everyone. And thank you, Stacy, and to the rest of our panel. We are greatly appreciative for all of your insight and um, guidance on how we can continue to take action for Georgia's local food. Um, as it is now one o'clock, we are out of time, but I want to thank all of our attendees for joining us today. Um, and I encourage you to please continue to monitor our website for uh, more upcoming Smarter Together webinars. Um, and that concludes our session for today. Have a great afternoon. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye, thank you. Thank you.